there. So in this lecture, I'd like to talk to you about momentum. And this accompanies section 1.8. Um, and let's see, 1.8 through 1.10 in matter and interactions, really. So to introduce the concept of momentum, which I hope you've seen before, um, linear momentum of an object is defined to be the product of the mass and the velocity. Um, so P, which is momentum, is equal to mv, where m is the mass and v is your velocity vector. Now, of course, the momentum is always going to point in the same direction as the velocity because mass can never be a negative value. Now, I always kind of wondered why P was used for momentum. It is in every textbook I can think of. Now, there's the obvious reason that you can't use M for momentum because you're already using M for mass, and it's in the same definition. But it turns out that if you've heard the word impetus, right, impetus meaning momentum or, you know, moving along, that actually comes from Latin, and it comes from the word petere in Latin, which means to go or to seek. And then according to um, everything that I have seen, petere also gives other words like appetite, perpetual, centripetal. Um, so it's a force for urging or a momentum towards doing something, an attack, an action. So that's kind of cool. Now, like I said, linear momentum is a vector quantity. It's uh, P is equal to M times V, the SI units of uh, mass are kilograms, and the SI units of velocity are, are meters per second. So the SI units of momentum are kilograms times meters per second. And of course, you can express it in a component form. Since it's a vector, it's going to have um, coordinates in X, Y, and Z. Now, the, your textbook, uh, Matter and Interactions, introduces momentum earlier, a lot earlier than other textbooks, which have a tendency not to introduce it until after they've introduced forces. But this is somewhat of an argument within physics because, honestly, Newton's second law, which you might remember from your 1000 physics class, uh, F equals MA, was originally expressed as the time rate of changes in momentum. So momentum in physics is a super important important idea. Um, of course, in the absence of external forces, momentum is conserved. In fact, you could say that Newton's first law could really be considered to say that the momentum of a body remains constant unless acted upon by an outside force, right? Um, and then Newton's second law, like I said, is expressed as the time rate of changes the momentum. So if you think about it, momentum um, really dictates a lot in terms of the motion of an object and the strength of the interaction that it takes to deflect that object. It really depends upon both the mass of the object and how fast it's going, and then that really dictates those things. And, and to think of the extreme of that, imagine somebody tosses you um, like a tennis ball, and then imagine somebody tosses to you at that same speed a bowling ball, right? I mean, the difference in the mass would make the bowling ball a lot harder to catch. Now take the other extreme and imagine that the mass is very low, but it's going super fast. So imagine, you know, you're uh, shot at by a bullet, right? I mean, so, so these are the kinds of things that you want to think about. And also, if you remember your problems from 1000 level physics, thinking about collisions, right? Um, I'm sure that they probably made you do the problem where, you know, you're in a subcompact car and you're hit by a transfer truck. Um, at least I always made my 1000 level students do that because I was always afraid on the highway. Okay, so let's do an example problem. This is problem 1.59 from your Matter and Interactions textbook. So let's go through this. An ice hockey puck of mass 170 grams enters the goal with a momentum of 0, 0, minus 6.3 kilogram meters per second crossing the goal line at a location 0, 0, minus 26 meters relative to an origin in the center of the rink. The puck had been hit by a player 0 0.4 seconds before reaching the goal. So what was the location of the puck when it was hit by the player, assuming negligible friction between the puck and the ice? Now the note here says that the ice surface lies in the XZ plane. Okay? All right, so let's break this down and let's think about it. Um, First of all, it told us to ignore friction. 
And so what that means is that uh, via Newton's first law, we can assume that the momentum of the puck doesn't change after it's hit by the player. And so what that would mean is that the player hits it, that imparts an initial velocity, and then we can ignore, um, we can assume that it's going to continue on at that velocity after it's hit because there's no other interactions that you need to consider. Okay, so... There you go. So the momentum is given at that time. So that would mean that the momentum isn't going to change after it's hit. So the momentum at the final position is going to be the same as the momentum at the hit. Now, remember that the rink is in the XZ plane, okay? So all the motion is in the Z direction. That means that if the final position is at 0, 0, minus 26, then that means that the final position, of course, is going to stay on the ice, right? What that would mean is that the XZ plane is the horizontal plane and the Y plane is up down, okay? And so the uh, motion is basically one-dimensional. OK, because the momentum is in the Z direction. So that means that the velocity is in the Z direction and the position, the final position is at at Z is equal to minus 26, but X is equal to zero. And of course, Y is equal to zero because it tells you that it stays on the ice. OK, so we have one dimensional motion, basically all the motions along the Z and um, it's on the X axis. Okay, so that means that our, our solution is going to be relatively straightforward. We can use the momentum equation, PZ is equal to MVZ, and we can solve for the velocity in the Z direction. Now, I don't call that Z VZ average. I don't call it VZ initial or final because remember, this is constant for the whole time. Okay, so PZ is equal to MVZ. That means that uh, PZ is minus 6.3 kilograms meters per second, as they told us in the um, problem. And then that's going to be equal to 0.1 seven kilograms times VZ because remember it told us the mass was 170 grams and the kilogram is the SI unit of mass. So we're going to convert that over and we have 0.17 kilograms. So now solving for VZ we get a velocity in the Z direction of minus 37.06 meters per second. Um, uh, I'm keeping a lot of digits until we get to the end there. So here we have minus 37.06 meters per second for the velocity in the Z direction. Now I'm going to use my position update equation, if you will. The Z final is going to equal to Z initial plus VZ times T, which we introduced earlier. It's from the definition of the average velocity. And plugging in for that, we don't know Z initial. That's what we're solving for in the problem. But Z final is minus 26 meters, so we plug in for that. We've solved for the Z velocity, so we plug in for that, minus 37.06 meters per second. And the time is going to be the time after the puck was hit, which is given in the problem as 0.4 seconds. So plugging in for all of those things, I'm going to multiply minus 37.06 times 0.4 and then add that to both sides to solve for Z initial. When I do that, I get Z initial is minus 11.2 meters, okay? So that means the coordinates of the hit are 0, 0, minus 11.2 meters since the uh, motion was in 1D, okay? All right, so that finishes up that example. Um, as always, if you uh, need a second to process, you can pause me. That's the real benefit of having me in a video, right? Okay, so uh, moving on to a later um, section. This is section 1.10 in your textbook where they discuss momentum at high speeds. Um, really, the definition that you learn in 1000 level physics for momentum, P is equal to mv, that's just an approximation. And you learn as you go on in physics that uh, the true equation for momentum, if you include um, the considerations of special relativity, which you should see in modern physics um, when you take that course, it's that as an object's speed approaches the speed of light, a better definition of momentum is P is equal to gamma mv. Okay, so what's gamma? Well, the gamma or the Lorentz factor is defined as 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where v is your speed, right, the speed of the object, and c is the speed of light, where uh, c is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So you can solve for this gamma factor for an object's speed. Now, for most everyday speeds, 
since um, gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared, if you think about everyday speeds where you're only going, say, a few hundred or even a few thousand meters per second, then you're dividing by the speed of light and squaring that ratio. You can imagine that that v squared over c squared factor is something that's very close to zero for everyday speeds, which means that for everyday speeds, gamma is very close to one. So that means that for classical mechanics, for slow speeds, the approximation that we use, and you learned in 1000 level physics, p is equal to mv, works very well. Um, but if you go to high speeds, right, where you're at a significant percentage of the speed of light, then the definition of momentum that Einstein came up with in 1905 in his special theory of relativity, which, like I said, you'll learn a lot more about in modern physics, then you can say that your momentum, your relativistic momentum, if, as you will, is, is going to be very different from your classical momentum, okay? So that's some jargon for you. When uh, we say the speed of an object, if it's a significant fraction of the speed of light, we say that it's traveling at a relativistic speed, okay? And then we have the relativistic definition of momentum and energy, by the way. Now, just to place this in context, if you solve for gamma and you're going a speed that's, say, 1% of the speed of light, which, by the way, is nothing to sneeze at, that's 3 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, really super fast compared to everyday speeds, that gives you a gamma value of 1.0001, okay? So you can see that you would only be off by 0.01%, right, if you, um, if you used the classical definition of momentum for something as fast as 3 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. You really wouldn't be off that much. Now, if you get to 10% of the speed of light, right, 3 times 10 to the 7th meters per second, your gamma goes to 1.005. So you're still really, really close. So you're saying, well, gosh, if it's that good, why bother? What am I looking at here? Well, here's a plot of the Lorentz factor as a fraction of the speed of light. And you can see that once you get to the speed of light over 2, like half the speed of light, it really starts to take off until when you approach the speed of light, your Lorentz factor blows up and approaches infinity, okay? So it's close to 1 for everyday speeds. And so for most of the problems in this class, you're not going to need to consider it at all. But it is worth noting that the expression that we use most of the time is really an approximation to the truth that really blows up once your speeds start to approach C. And to do um, really emphasize that fact, I wanted to work problem 65 from chapter 1 in Matter and Interactions. When the speed of a particle is close to the speed of light, the ratio of the correct relativistic momentum, gamma mv, to the non-relativistic momentum, mv, is quite large. Such speeds are attained in particle accelerators, and at these speeds the approximate non-relativistic equation for momentum is a poor approximation. Calculate gamma for the case where the speed is 99.96% of the speed of light, c. Okay, so let's do this calculation. Gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. If you're traveling at 99.96% of the speed of light, you could write that your speed v was equal to 0.9996c, right? Okay, so when we plug that into our equation for gamma, we would have 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.9996c squared divided by c squared. Now the c's cancel out, okay? So there's no need to go through and multiply times 3 times 10 to the 8th on the top and the bottom. You're really just wasting your time. Your c's, c squared on the top and the c squared on the bottom cancel out, and it leaves you with the expression 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.9996 squared, okay? And then you can solve for that. When you do that, you get gamma is equal to 35.36. So if a particle were traveling at this speed, Using the classical definition of momentum would give a very wrong answer. But to emphasize how wrong it is, I'd like to show you the percent error equation. Okay? So in the percent error equation, what you do is you take 100% and you multiply it times the answer that you've predicted or the answer that you got, right, minus the true answer, and then you divide that by the true answer. Okay? So that's what I've done here. 100% times mv minus gamma mv divided by gamma mv. 
Now when I do that, the MVs are on the top and the bottom of every term there, so I can cancel them all out. What I end up with is 100% times 1 minus gamma over gamma, okay? Plugging in the numbers that we got for gamma, I end up with 100% times minus 34.36 divided by 35.36, right? That gives me a percent error of negative 97%, okay? Wow, you're really off, okay? <laughs> so for everyday speeds, the percent error for P is equal to MV is very low. But once you get up to the speeds achieved in uh, colliders or accelerators like CERN, for example, then you're really, really super off if you use the everyday classical expression for your momentum. Now, I'm not going to harp on this too much in this class. I'm going to leave uh, worrying about relativistic momentum and energy expressions. I'm going to leave that to modern physics, okay? But I did want to show it to you here, and I hope you enjoyed that little detour. All right, I'll see you around. See you in class. As always, let me know if you have any questions.